Hello, everyone. I'm Father Enrique Salvo, Rector of St. Patrick's Cathedral, and we are so blessed this day to have Father Chad Ripperger here with us, who is here at the cathedral to give a talk and, and to be with us, to pray with us, and we are so blessed. Father Chad Ripperger, who is the Superior General of the Society of Our Sorrowful Mother and also one of the leading exorcists and, and, and one that teaches so much about that in the United States and in the world, is here with us to tell us all about your mission. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Father, for having me. So what can I, what can I say? Tell us a little bit about your background, how your, your, your vocation, how not necessarily the priesthood, but just like the whole thing, your, your studies and everything to have gotten to this point. Um, well, I think that the, the primary reason was because the um, Archdiocese of Omaha, which I was living in at the time, because I was originally ordained for the priesthood fraternity of St. Peter before um, uh, Archbishop Aquila asked for me to be released to start this society. So um, I was stationed there and the, the local pastor um, was talking to one gentleman, and the gentleman actually manifested, so he came up into my room, and I had just got done writing three books on psychology, so he said, hey, would you come down and take a look at this guy? And when I went into the office, he me, showed me, he just handed me the ritual of, of the part that you can actually do without faculties, and so I just started, got a little bit of the prayer, the guy full-blown manifested, and I just said, well, send him to the archdiocese, and then the archdiocese um, says, well, we don't have an exorcist. And at, in that time, it, it, there was only about five exorcists in the country who knew what they were doing. Um, one of them was actually here in New York at the time. This was, you know, 17 years ago. But, uh, and then um, I said, well, you know, get an exorcist, you know, thinking that you could just call one up. And so they called around, nobody was willing to do it. And then they asked me if I'd be willing to do it. And so then from that point on, I became their exorcist, but I got training after that um, from uh, two exorcists and then started doing the work. And then um, over the course of time, it just became my full-time work. We actually do formal training for priests and for um, the lay people, healthcare professionals about how to recognize this stuff. And so we do travel for that. I do do conferences, but that's kind of tapering off a little bit. But um, most of our caseloads, we actually take cases from um, primarily around the United States, but we also take them internationally. Um, and so, um, but we do all the exorcisms there in Denver because um, my working relationship with my archbishop is very good. And so if I come across the case, he can immediately give me faculties for the case and then we can proceed. So I do most of the, um, the actual exorcisms there. The only time we'll go somewhere else is if it's necessary to get the person to the point where they can travel. Outside of that, we have them actually come to us. Oh, okay. We do go to certain dioceses sometimes because they'll ask us to come in and do an exorcism over a particular place that's bad or if they don't feel like they have a priest that is um, trained sufficiently well enough to do that. That's a very good point about the pr training of priests because it's something that, of course, we learn about in a very basic way in seminary. It's, it's, it's something that we know is real, but it's not something that, of course, you can like, it, you sign up to as one of the basic courses in seminaries. People might imagine. <laughs> That's true. There, it's it's yeah. something that it's it's really not as spoken about, perhaps uh, at least hasn't been for a while. So one of your missions is really to also help priests get educated. In That's this, correct. Right? Yeah. And so what we do is we actually provide like a three day course where we we invite priests to come. Um, I've also written a book called Diabolic Influence. So there's two different books. There's actually Diabolic Influence, which is for the clergy. And that contains all the diagnostic materials and everything that the priest would actually need to know so that once he got done reading it, he would at least be able to do basic deliverance work. You know, not necessarily possession stuff, but at least he would be able to deliver people from um, like diabolic oppression or obsessions and things of that sort. Um, and, the, and also to know um, how to exercise like buildings and places like that. So we, there's that, and then the one for the lay people is Dominion, which is, doesn't contain um, an, a, a, a quite a bit of the diagnostic materials because of, for a variety of reasons. And so basically, so we've written those two books, but then also we actually provide um, consultation with priests over um, the phone if they need help. We also actually provide what we call a protocol, which is basically we tell people if someone comes in and you think they have diabolic influence, put them on this prayer regimen first and begin this process to start eliminating the pack. Because through the, if they do the protocol carefully, it by the time they get done with it, which is 30 days, 
you'll have a pretty good sense of whether the problem is psychological or not, and then it's therefore out of your competence and you want to send them to a healthcare professional. Whereas if it is diabolic, a lot of times it'll start to clear out, and then we can, but it, the protocol is in four stages, and usually um, they won't get through all four stages because it'll clear out before they get to the second or third stage. And so a lot of times priests like that because it takes the burden off of them praying over the person regularly for you know a, a long period of time. So we would pray for them throughout this time or? Yes, you would pray for them and then your primary- But not necessarily in the process of- Right, and so there's two reasons for that. One is to take the burden off of the priest because otherwise you'd just be praying with all sorts of people all yeah. the time. And especially if you become proficient at it, then God starts sending you even more people and then it, yes. becomes, it becomes burdensome. But the other part of it is, um, and this is something when I was first an exorcist, when people had diabolic obsession, I would just pray over it, pray over them and just blow it out pretty quickly, usually within about three days to a week. It would just get most people cleared up. But what I found is, is that they had bad habits, and so they would end up falling back into the behavior that allowed the demon back in. And so part of this protocol is to get people to clean them up spiritually, get them back to the sacraments, get them straightened out to where they're leading a basic Catholic life, but then also avoiding the sins that they need to, but then getting that discipline they need to maintain the course so that when they do get liberated, they don't fall back into the things that caused the problem. Like here in New York City, for example, and in so many United States, um, it's no secret that there is a, there's been a rise of mental health issues. Yes. And of course, here, in, for example, it's in Patrick's Cathedral, in Midtown Manhattan, where there's so much going on and everything. As in many other places before, I was in the Bronx myself, so I'm just talking about my own experiences in this and experiences I've heard other brother priests have. We have a lot of mental health people that are victims of mental health problems. Right. And many of them can come to you and, and also say, well, I feel like I'm, uh, I'm possessed or I'm, I'm going through you know, something like in their own words, putting it that basically they feel that it's, it's some type of, of demonic thing. And right. it might be a combination, right? That's correct, yeah. In a situation like that, I usually recommend, well, you know, there is, I recommend the protocol to them and say, look, there's a way to kind of climb out of this. If you're only gonna see them once, it's usually not the type of people that are gonna stick to it to get through it because to get liberated, People have to work at it, and it's okay. hard. And so, um, because a lot of times people have this idea, well, if I'm possessed, you just wave your wand, and then yeah. I'm clean, and I don't have any problems, and I don't have to do any work. And that's actually, we, we often tell people, it's actually easier to climb out of a psychological problem, most of them, I should say, than it is the uh, than something that's diabolic. But the, the diabolic relates to the psychological in three ways. Some people's problems are entirely diabolic. So I'm working with a woman who's possessed right now. When the demons leave her alone, she is as sane and as normal as the day is long. Wow. But then um, there is people whose problems are entirely psychological, or they can also be psychiatric. So people can be hearing voices and things like that. For um, one case I had, the guy was, um, it was caused by drug-induced psychosis. So he actually smoked marijuana, and then he ended up having... Um, psychosis from it, and so, um, and the prayer wouldn't have any effect on it, right? So his t his problem is purely psychiatric. You can also have people that's purely psychological. Um, they have different causes, and that's what I go into in my book at length. Of this is how you would discern those, and then, but most people that we see, it's a combination of both. So even if they didn't have psychological problems before the diabolic influence. The demon starts picking at them psychologically, and then he, they slowly take them down and get them into bad psychological habits. But also, you can have people um, people that just are their psychological issues, and then you can have demons layered on top of that. So one of the ones we see commonly, um, it's becoming more common, particularly because satanic ritual abuse is on the rise, um, especially since 1980 is when we see a lot of the cases just really start to rise is um, disassociative identity disorder, which used to be called multiple personality disorder, which is actually a primarily a psychological mechanism that's, it, that's disordered there. But you can also have diabolic influence layered on top of that. And so um, they really need to be under the health care professionals' um, guidance and things of that sort of counsel during that process. So, and that's one of the uh, things that the protocol is very helpful for is it is not just helps to get people cleaned up, but it also can be a, somewhat of a diagnostic. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, because if, if it's purely psychological, it's not gonna make any difference, their prayer regimen. Whereas if it's diabolic, it'll, things will start to change. 
and um, in very in very consistent patterns because demons are extraordinarily consistent, even though they don't seem like it, but they they are because the way they attack us, it doesn't seem like they are, but they're very consistent, and so you can actually track the patterns as they go through this and get a sense of your problem psychological or it's diabolical or it's both because even that has its own distinctive patterns. When someone's going through that, and and sometimes um, we hear a story, or or, or, or sometimes. I think we've all been perhaps in, in prayer in retreats or, or so on that's something manifests in someone. And when someone's going through that, <clears throat> obviously as the church, we see them as a victim of something that we have to care for. That yes, we have, like, we have part, to yeah. like, I, just like any other type of, of, of poverty of poverties, but this is like a spiritual one, most intense one. On the other hand, there might obviously be a stigma of like, what did that person do to this, to 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 become that way? Right. Uh, what what did that person like offer themselves to the enemy? I mean, <laughs> did, yes. did someone? Under, I mean, so what what should be as as Catholics, as just as all of us as Catholics as priests, what should be our our our, our way? We should have more compassion about this. We right? should, actually, yes. Yeah, in point and fact, there's, um, people can become possessed or even diabolically influenced through three different kinds of causes. Uh -huh. One is for our moral sin. So if we commit a moral sin, that's an open door to possession, right? And so not that everybody who commits moral sin becomes possessed, but obviously, but it's one of those things that it can be an open door. So sometimes it's the case. But if somebody's coming for actual help or they're trying to lead a Catholic life, there should be a compassion like, okay, well, we've all messed up. And so we all have to kind of start the process of cleaning ourselves up. Um, some people, it's just different than others. Obviously, our problem wouldn't be necessarily diabolic, but other people's are. The other side is too, sometimes God does allow the demons into the person's life, which is something I'm going to talk about in the conference tonight, but it's is in order to in the process to become, become very holy through the battle because they have to develop a, lot, a high level of virtue and they become very holy and it, it, it's a purification process that can happen. So sometimes it's the, it's the sin that they've committed. Sometimes it's through no fault of their own. So about mm. 50 to 80% of the women who show up on our doorstep that are possessed, it's because they've been raped, molested, or sexually or gravely psychologically abused. And that disorder that they suffer is the open door for the demon to get their foot in the door. And so it's not always their fault. And sometimes people say, well, that doesn't seem fair. But those are the people specifically that when they start the process of becoming liberated, they become very holy. The, the, the amount of forgiveness that you see, these, the grace of forgiveness these people are given is just astounding because they forgive the people that perpetrated this stuff against them. And then the other kind is something that I've only read about, I've never seen, and that is somebody who becomes possessed um, or diabolically influenced um, through no fault of their own and nothing else as bad has happened to them. So one time a nun in um, Iowa became possessed and they asked, the exorcist got to the point where he said, what sin did she commit to get in? He said, she didn't commit any sin. And he said, well, why are you here? And he said, because there's a sin in the region and God wants reparation made for it. And so he contacted the bishop. They set up adoration to make reparation for it. Two days later, she was liberated. The sin was divorce. Wow. Yeah. So this was, uh, so there's some, but those are cases I've only read about. I've never actually seen any of those. Usually it's because something bad has happened to people or they've done something bad. But, but if they're trying to work and overcome it, there's, uh, it's, it's a, you, you naturally, anybody who has any kind of natural human feelings would have compassion for them because their suffering is tremendous. Of course. And, and sometimes I, obviously the, I think the natural reaction to people is just like, get scared and just like go away. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, well, and I tell people, judge or, I tell people, look, possession isn't contagious. So, <laughs> <laughs> because, because I, I think that some people do think a little oh, bit. Oh, oh, they do. Yeah, some of that is from Hollywood, right? Because Hollywood yeah. shows the, the, uh, the spirits jumping from one person to another. And that's not exactly how that works. Unless the person themselves does something evil uh, you know, f or invites him in, then they will. Okay. But uh, if but if they're leading a good Catholic life and they're not getting involved in anything evil and they're trying to stay out of sin, they're relatively immune. I mean, you're, 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 I've never seen people like that become possessed being around other possessed people. In fact, most um, when we work with people, we require them to have um, a relative or close friend that accompanies them at each and every session. 
Mm. And part of that, there's two reasons for that. One is um, so that they have a support system through the process because it's very difficult. But part of it is, and it sounds bad, but I, I don't have time to babysit because sometimes when you get done with a session, the person is pretty wrung out mm. and I've got to go to another session. And so I, it, so I have, that way they can be properly taken care of and, and tended to. So, um, but those people that are the support system, they do get attacked, but it's just so that they want, it's, it's not that the demons are trying to get into them, he's trying to drive them away. Okay. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit different kind of a thing, but re they're relatively immune. If they maintain their prayer life, they usually don't have any difficulty going the whole distance of the liberation process. And speaking of Hollywood, that you <laughs> mentioned, there's, I mean, there's almost like a, in Hollywood, it's it's become more and more of a thing, and yeah, and, and but like even for young people, right? Uh, in in terms of like how many things are portrayed, but almost glorified, right? Yes, in many that's ways. Right. Yeah. Do you have, is that is that do you think a, a, like something that especially for parents to look out for their their young your their kids in the in that sense? Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, if you're going to watch it with your children at a certain age, they need it needs to be explained. But th that's also why I would just say, look, there's certain movies I would watch. Like Nefarious is pretty good. The um, Exorcism of Emily Rose is actually based on a true story. Uh, her original name is Annalise Michelle. Um, and the movie doesn't get it quite right because it's based on a book that uh, didn't get her life quite right because um, she was an extraordinarily holy woman. Um, and she became possessed the first time. She actually became possessed twice. The first time was because a woman in her hometown cursed her. The second time is when Our Lady appeared to her because she had been liberated. Our Lady appeared to her and said, would you allow this again so that many would come to knowledge of the spiritual realities? And she said, yes. She was a victim soul, basically. Mm -hmm. So, but her, in her particular case, she, um, so there, there's her, so those, that type of, that movie is pretty good, it's, it's generally good. Um, the movie Nefarious, I think, gets it right as far as to the psychology of it. Obviously, there's not any exorcisms and things going on in the process. But to, to see the personality and the malevolence and the, the malice and things like that coming through, the cunningness of it. There's only a couple of things when I met the guys, I said I would change just a couple of minor things, but they didn't cut away from the substance of the movie. But a lot of the other ones are just sensationalized, like The Pope's Exorcist is completely sensationalized. I saw that one. Yeah, and I, I just tell people, look, this is just not how it works. The one thing that Hollywood really gets wrong, though, on a consistent basis is leaving the impression, and it's done for sensational purposes, leaving people with the impression that the exorcist is scared and the demon is bold. And that's actually the exact opposite of the way it is. Because the, especially with an experienced exorcist, the demons act within a gamut. As long as he stays in his lane, he's safe because he's got the church's protection backing him up. And so as long as he stays in it, it doesn't mean that it's not a boxing match, because it is, but, you're, it, but he's relatively safe. Whereas the demon, knows that he's about to take a brutal beating and there's nothing he can do about it. Wow. And so he's the one that's actually scared. They're very good at hiding it a lot of times, but you can tell by their nervous laughter and things like that, that they're, they're scared to death when, they, when an experienced exorcist walks in because they know this is gonna be really ugly for them. And so it's actually the other way around. It's actually the demons that are scared, not the exorcist. So they, they kind of get that wrong. They also kind of leave the impression that you know uh, that every every possession case is you know where like an Annalise Michelle's movie where everything's flying around and there's all exactly. this stuff. and that's just not how it works. I mean, it does happen, but it's only I, we keep statistics actually. It only happens in about seven percent of the cases. The rest of them are all pretty much the demon manifests. You beat him up and he leaves. You know, it's it, there's not a whole lot of stuff that's externally going on, um, and there's not a lot of sensationalized stuff that's going on. People ask, you know, have you seen all the stuff in Hollywood? Yeah, I've seen that stuff, but it's just not that common. That's interesting to know. I, yeah. That's actually something that most people wouldn't think because you, you, we're so used to, like, thinking about, you know, the supernatural strength and the faces oh, yeah. and the voices and all that. Yeah, and even those things, after a while, you know they're just doing those to try and get an effect. Exactly. And, so they're, and so you're just... Um, I, in fact, I usually don't tolerate that stuff. I beat them up for doing those kinds of things. And after a while, it gets kind of, uh, being an exorcist is a grind, right? Because it's the sure. same stuff over and over. It's the same demons a lot of times over and over and over. It's the same stuff over and over and over. So after a while, you're just like, okay, my job is just to stand here with a sledgehammer and Christ just keeps putting rocks in front and I just keep. And so it's a work, it's a lot of work, it's a grind. 
And the sensational stuff doesn't really, it's interesting. The really interesting stuff is what they end up, what God compels them to re reveal about him or the Our Lady or the saints. So you'll learn things about them that is just absolutely stunning. And so those are the things that are really interesting about this line of work, not the stuff the demons do. Wow. Well, it's the gospel, right? The way yeah. that Jesus would come and, and you know, he, they, they had to go and they would suffer. And, and, yep. and actually, some, sometimes it was them that would point out that this was Jesus. Jesus. Yes, exactly. It's the same kind of thing. And so you'll hear like, cert, like certain perfections that um, saints had or, you know, because the, they become the nemesis of a particular demon who inspires people to the opposite vice. And so their nemesis is this other saint. And so sometimes the saint will actually come and afflict the demon during the process or the demons were forced to reveal who their nemesis is and why. And usually it's some perfection that the saint has. And obviously Our Lady is very involved in this. And so you learn all sorts of things about her interior perfections and her interior life that you would just never hear. I mean, saints, a lot of times saints will talk about these things, but just not with the kind of realism and concreteness that the, that the, the demons. And sometimes they can lie about that stuff, but it's, it's very rare. They usually lie about other things and not that. Um, so the manifestation is uh, about 95% of what an exorcist sees is called morphing, which is where the person changes shape, right? right? And it's not extreme. It can be extreme during certain times as I mentioned in those 7% mm -hmm. of the cases. But most of the time, it's just something that's beyond the person's ability to, to cause. And so you know, okay, this is what we're actually dealing with. And they each, each demon manifests differently because as St. Thomas Aquinas says, he said, they manifest according to the characteristics or the, uh, the qualities of their nature. And so you do get a sense of them just by their manifestation. So they'll just manifest and then they talk through the individual and then you can compel them to tell because the church says, ask these questions. It's basically the information you need to get them out. And then once they give you the last piece of information, then they're gone. God uses everything, doesn't he, for good? He does, exactly. Uh, yeah, even in this, even yeah, in the cases exactly. of possession, these people become very holy. I'm, I'm sure. And, you know, they're forced to reveal certain things. They, they, you know, as an exorcist, you learn a lot. But they, even as an exorcist, you become very holy because, A, it deepens your faith because you see the spiritual realities. These things are very real when you're in the midst of them. Um, and so it strengthens your faith, but it also just seeing people grow in holiness through the battle that are possessed or, or even obsessed and things of that sort is actually very um, uh, encouraging and it, it's, it's admirable. You know, it, it helps my faith just seeing the graces that they're given. One of the best lines I ever heard was from an exorcist in Rome. He said, being an exorcist is living the Christian life writ large. And by that he means is the, is the fact that there's so many different facets of the church's teaching that come out and it's so clear about the real these realities because the demons are talking about them very clearly and matter of factly. And it's interesting because every demon falls in relationship to some point of Catholic doctrine that he, f he fell in some point of Catholic doctrine. And so it's, it's, it gives you a deep sense of how true everything the church teaches. It, everything it teaches is absolutely true. And so this is something that, you know, it, it does really give you a, a clarity about the church's um, teaching and the faith. The power of the sacraments, yes. sacramentals. Sacramentals, yeah. Considering in the population, in, in, in the church, it's the, the people to get to the point where they can be considered possessed mm -hmm. that need you, for example, mm -hmm. that's... that's that's a, a, a small, very small, percentage. very small percentage, yeah. right? Yeah, we. In fact, it's kind of funny because in our community, about seven years ago, we started keeping statistics about the percentages of people that are, that ask for help and what percentages are psychological, which aren't. And what we discovered is is, and we think this is true about the general populace, that the that the number of people that come to you need thinking they need help or possess is 0.5 percent of the people. Wow. So, you know, out of, out of 200 people, only one usually is actually possessed. Obsession, where the demons are attacking them psychologically, is much higher. So that's what I wanted to ask you about. So yeah. what's the other level that we, like most people should be, I mean, not yeah. that we should be ever, we should always be on top of our spiritual life, our the right. state of our soul and everything. But what would be more common what do you, and what would be some advice for all of us to, to be... Uh, perhaps more protected or? Well, the principal way you keep yourself protected is staying in the state of grace. 
Exactly. I mean, and so, you know, and, and leading an authentic Catholic life, getting to Mass on Sundays and Holy Days, you know, getting to confession on a regular basis, saying your prayers, doing all those things that the Catholics recommend, making use of the sacraments. If you're just leading a normal Catholic life, your odds of becoming diabolically um, obsessed or even oppressed, obviously possessed, is going to be extraordinary, but um, is very low. I mean, the percentage of the people. But it's also the case that um, even if they don't lead a good Catholic life, then if once they just start, you'd be surprised, you probably wouldn't, but it, the number of people that they're diabolically obsessed and all they have to do is they go to confession and get everything confessed properly, it blows out like 80% of the people that actually need your help. You know, if you're just going to a good general confession, getting all that stuff taken care of. So just leading a good Catholic life, but then also, um, the one thing I'm going to talk extensively tonight about is discipline. We have to be disciplined in our spiritual life. And we, the common element we see among people who are diabolically obsessed and oppressed, so obsession is when they ta attack us psychologically. Oppression is when they attack our externals, like our health, um, our relationships, our finances, things of that sort. What we find is in almost every single one of those cases, it's because the person is undisciplined in their spiritual life. So once we get them praying and doing certain things on a consistent basis and practicing self-denial, 80 to 90% of it clears out just in doing that. And sometimes you do see some people that it just like, it seems like everything's going wrong in their life. It is, that's true, yeah. Uh, everything, like all the aspects, it's almost like, I, I've, I talk to some people, it's like, it's almost embarrassing. I have to, to ask uh, for prayers for even one more thing and, and one yeah. more thing, but, but they're good people living. So, so right. people, under that level would not get to the point perhaps of, of coming to an exorcist. Right. Uh, is there a way for, uh, for, even for us priests to help discern if, if it's really an oppression or an obsession or if it's just uh, the cross that, that maybe they're carrying right, right now? Uh, well, the, the, the way that you're going to notice that it's from a, a spiritual that is a diabolic cause is it's going to respond to prayer in some fashion. So if the per, if they, so we started a protocol and if, if people follow that protocol, what we find is, is that you'll, you'll start to see things shift. So the oppression will very often, if they maintain on that protocol and get through the protocol, usually that will just clear it out. So if the person starts saying specific prayers, and I'll mention um, one here specifically in a minute, but if they, if they say the prayers on a consistent basis, then what'll happen is that it slowly drives the diabolic out. That's what I was taught as an exorcist, the way that you overcome oppression is by increasing your spiritual life, or increasing your prayer life specifically, and then it, it slowly tapers off. And so if they start to increase their prayer life and they start to noticing it's getting a little bit better, that's an indicator that it's from a, that it's from a diabolic cause. Whereas if, it's, if, it, if they keep maintaining the prayers and they're doing everything and they're leading a good Catholic life, that's probably a sign it's from some other cause and they need to take a look at that. But the, what, there's two things that they can do is they can actually ask Our Lady of Sorrows, specifically under that title, reveal to me what's the source of the problem here? Because a lot of times then she'll give them a grace to see this is where this is coming from, and then they can start cleaning it up. But the one thing that we usually recommend, that I recommend for oppression, at least for people to try initially, unless they need to go on the protocol to really r ramp things up, is there's a prayer of consecration of one's exterior goods. It's based on the consecration of St. Louis Marie de Montfort. And basically, but it's tailored specifically to consecrating the specific areas that the demons are oppressing. So like if it's your finances, people are, you know, you're, you're um, both the inflows where people aren't paying you, there's problems, you're, you're um, you know, you're not just, the, your boss isn't paying or there's money just isn't coming in or the outflows where you're just like, every time you turn around, this thing's breaking down, you got to pay this, you got to pay that. So what we tell people is start consecrating that every day with this prayer. Um, it's in the book called Deliverance Prayers for the Lady. They can just get it online. And if they say that prayer every single day well, um, for a little while, if they start to notice it just stops, then, then, then that's usually what will happen. That prayer tends to be the most efficacious. And part of it has to do with the fact that a demon under duress revealed that if we consecrate things to Our Lady, once she accepts them, they're not permitted to touch them. And so that's why that prayer has such an impact. Whereas the, um, but the prayer life, but that still means they're still gonna have to uh, ramp up their prayer life to some degree. Well, it's beautiful though that, that we have you know, with the church, the, yes. that people have ways to actually not be victims all the time of, of these things. Yeah, it's funny because a lot of times people say, well, do you ever work with Protestants? And the answer is, yeah, we do. 
And it's usually because their ministers haven't been able to get rid of the stuff. Uh So they come to us because the Catholic Church is actually the one that has the means to clean these things up. And what about, um, this happens a lot in, for example, I, when I used to be a, 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 a pastor in the Bronx, and it, it happens a lot within a lot of our communities. In it, Like, for example, here in New York, we have a lot of people from, from uh, the Caribbean, Africa, places like that, in which, unfortunately, they, 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 I've seen the most beautiful faith in the church and the most real and impalpable, like just love for God and our blessed mother and and everything. But unfortunately there's, there's a type of a a, a cultural thing when it has to do with Santeria and Ruru and, and Botanicas and all that. And so a lot of, it's very common in, in that, that people say they come and like, I've been cursed. I've been, something has been done to me. Like how much power do these people have? Really, like, do I mean, like, for example, the 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 lady at at the, the Santeria place. How much power do they have, really, to do these things? Like, how how how, how seriously should we take it if someone comes to us and say, "I've been cursed," and and what should, right. and what can the person do? Because for that matter, I mean, that that that's it's scary to even think about that that can be something as it is. Most curses, unless you're involved, unless it involves possession, most curses there's actually a, a short series of prayers a priest can do to break them. It's actually not that difficult to break those. As a, that's at least in my experience, as a general rule, there are some that become very difficult, but that's because there's a series of rituals that have been done, and you need to undo those. So it's and that's usually in possession cases. So that takes that's a little ex- bit extreme. Yeah. yeah, and and the the amount of influence that some of the practitioners of the, these things have is depends upon their proficiency. So there's some people who are so deep into it, and they're very proficient. It's been in their families for generations, sometimes for hundreds of years. Those are the people that are very proficient, and so when they do stuff, it has a tremendous effect on people. On the other hand, you can keep yourself protected just by asking our Lord to keep you protected from anybody who would curse you. Right. So just sure. saying a simple prayer, just asking St. Michael to keep you um, from being cursed. Obviously, don't go to them and ask for help. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> uh, I, whenever I pass one, I always ask Jesus to cover me with the precious blood. Right. Yes, that's right. Yes. Precious blood is one Even of the Even if you're passing it down the street and everything. That's right, yeah. And, 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 and so many times it, in, our, in our communities, it's very common for people to come with very innocently. It's all innocent. Yeah. Uh, they come from with little things and yes. little charms and things that they get in these places. Yeah, but we had to we had to show them that that it's not good. Yes, that exactly. It's, that it's, yeah, and basically what it basically boils down to is you just have to educate them because yes. a lot of times they just don't know. At least that's something like more like in your face and more like common and and perhaps it's more like in the light so it's probably less dangerous than things that probably have been in behind the scenes that's very true like who knows what happens in behind the scenes here in new york at large what happens in throughout the world and that's That's right that's probably not to mention of course the places of evil right that's right yeah yeah but in point in fact um you know, in fact, I tell people, like, when you hear these witches, oh, we're going to curse so-and-so, and they say it publicly, or the, the Satanists say those things. I always tell people those are low-level people in the, in the thing. The, really, the people that are at the top of this, where, the, as I mentioned, like witchcraft that's been in their family line sometimes for three or 400 years, these people's knowledge of this stuff is almost on the same level as mine. And, and, and they know they're using demons to do this stuff. Um, they're, they, they're doing, they do it in such a manner you would never know. You would never know who these people actually are. It's the same thing with the high-level Satanists. The low-level Satanists that make themselves known, those are low-level guys, right? doesn't wow. mean they can't cause damage. Yeah. But the, it's the guys at the very top, the types of things that they are doing are so bad that that's why it's occult, it's hidden. And they actually, and those are the guys that we should be you know, worried about. And we have to ask our Lord and Our Lady to bring them to the light so that it can be addressed. And just not take it for granted that it, it is happening, right? Yeah, it is. But but I like I always tell people like you're right about obviously the the when my parishioner would come and say I think I've been cursed. So it's like well the prayer of the church and the blessing of the priest is more powerful than the ladies that's walking that's, that's walking right. down the street. That's we right. Also to remember that it's not right. giving that much power either for the the low level like you say. That's right. And a lot of it is is if they're just leading if they're staying in the state of grace and yes. they're not. 
And one of the things that we've noticed too is not with everybody, because there are times when it happens when, when this isn't the case, but a lot of times when people are cursed, the curse can only ends up having an effect because there's some sinful aspect in the person's life that's the open door. Uh, and so a lot of times if they just clean up their life, a lot of times that'll even itself will break the curse or keep them immune. So as I mentioned, you know, staying in the state of grace, but also just avoiding all mortal sin will itself keep you relatively uh, protected. You have so many beautiful talks that we that I've seen so many in YouTube and so on, and and then you have your books. Uh, that that's a lot of the you have a lot of the teachings there because I'm sure I mean there's so much to this, right? There is, yeah, yeah, and that's actually why I wrote the long book because in the ritual of exorcism, it's and the it's uh, in the new rite it's called the pre but in the old rite it's called the note, and basically in there it says you should read the approved authors. Well, the problem is someone like me who knows Latin, that's okay, because it's strewn over literally thousands of years, and it's different people talk about different facets. And so I decided, you know, so I, someone needs to just write a manual, pull all this information together from all the authors throughout history about this and get it all together in a single synthetic, you know, a synthesis of all the information of that information. And so that's why I actually wrote the book. So, and that's, it's not my chosen line of work, but I figured, well, if I'm here, I might as well do it. There's certain priests, I mean, most priests can do basic deliverance. Yes, work. I know yeah, that, yeah. but to that but point. To, yeah, but to, but exorcism, to actually do solemn exorcism for possession, yes. you have to have the right kind of training. You have to have the right kind of personality. You also have to have, as we were talking earlier privately, but you have to have a level of prayer life to maintain it. Our community, we're a semi-contemplative order, and then the only other thing we do is exorcism work. So we pray three to four hours a day. And, wow, um, and that, that includes the, um, the, 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 the mass, but it also includes, we do the old right office because it's much more extensive. It's longer, <clears throat> um, and it's a little bit more contemplative. Plus then we have required meditation. There's also a series of prayers we say because the, the demons can attack in a variety of different ways. And so the prayers are designed to keep us from being attacked in those various different ways. And so it's about three and uh, just about three to th three to four hours of prayer. And I've, I've always found that if I always maintain that, and you know, I don't have any problems. It's if something happens and I can't get to something that that's when I start to feel it. So if as long as a person maintains their prayer life, and I think that's one of the things that a lot of priests that are in a parish, they just don't have that kind of time. Yeah. So, unfortunately. On behalf of all of us, thank you for, for what you're doing. And uh, we'll, we'll, I know that you're, you're praying for all of us and, and we're going to be praying for you too. Please, in, yeah. In, in, in your ministry. And, and, and saying it's here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. We're just so grateful that you're here for, for this talk and this mission. It's, it's, it's something that so many people need to learn about. And like you say, all this will take us to appreciate more about the reality of the beautiful things That's exactly of our right. faith. That's right. So it's not just about, because some people, it, it can happen. And I, and, and we, I think we all know some people that ups, like almost talk, like focus, like you'll, they'll say the word devil more than Jesus. Absolutely. And that's, that's like right. the thing that we really have to like watch out for, right? Absolutely. In fact, that's one of the ways you can become diabolically influenced. Wow. Is by paying too much attention to yeah. it. And part of it is they want the attention because they're selfish, the demons. And I tell people, well, well one of the first principles in keeping yourself protected is um, don't focus on it. Don't, if you see something, it's like St. Uh, Peter said, you know, be watchful and vigilant. So if you see something, then address it. Otherwise, your focus should be on God. And thank you for the prayers, because that's we really need them. We depend on people for that. Well, let's all promise that prayer, because what they do is so powerful and so necessary for the church. And, and we're all in this together. So let's, let's all promise to pray for, for, for Father Chad and all of his order. Thank you very much. Yeah, so thank you. Always welcome here at St. Patrick's Cathedral. Oh, I hope to come back. Yes, and and that's what, what a beautiful invitation about also helping us priests to get a little bit more training because I think yes. that's something that's very helpful for, for all of us to help our people. I think so too. So thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you.